For those of you who are tuning in, our next presenter is Julia Decker, and she'll be coming on at 1230. Uh, hi. So for my past storm, I chose to research um, conservation in Connecticut. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the environmental threats that affect our native wildlife and how we can help as individuals and really move forward. Um, so the first threat I'll be talking about is pollution. Uh, and I also am going to include live animals. So we've got the first one. Here, as you can see, we have a native gray tree frog. Amphibians are really susceptible to pollution because they have a semi-permeable skin, which means that more chemicals and other substances can easily enter their body. So uh, pollution affects our native wildlife by causing issues such as reproductive failure and neurological effects. Uh, and that can even affect humans when things such as bioaccumulation occur. So when we eat um, a fish that has eaten a bunch of smaller fish, um, you know, the microplastics and chemicals that the small prey has eaten build up enough and can cause those effects as well. Um, so some of the ways, uh, another animal affected by pollution are, are osprey. So those are a native um, hawk, often called fish hawk. Um, the way they're affected by pollution is between um, the 40s and the 70s. Uh, the use of the pesticide DDT caused the thinning of their eggshells, uh, which meant that less offspring were born and it really reduced the population. Um, as, as people, we've really done a great job and their population has dramatically increased now, which is great due to the control of runoff and the pesticide DDT. So that's one way we've really helped with that population. Uh, uh, some other ways you can help fight against pollution are by uh, are by are using eco-friendly products such as um, alternatives to fertilizers and pesticides, pesticides and um, the cleaners that you use in your own home and you want to make sure you're disposing of them properly uh, and reading the instructions on the back is one way you can really help. Um, you can also be a conscious consumer and what that means is that when you buy or use something you want to, use, uh, want to think about the environmental cost of it. So that means um, thinking about the resources that went into it, the transportation, um, and the, um, the energy required to reduce it. So that's things such as clothing, packaging, and food. And we'll talk more about food later during our climate change um, presentation. You can also help in local efforts. Uh, I know Connecticut has done a really good job at creating the plastic bag ban. I know during quarantine it's kind of changed, but um, that's one step towards the, towards the making progress. You can also help in cleanup efforts on beaches, such as Hannah Method. We usually hold um, events where you can help clean up pollution from our beaches. Uh, with that, I'll move on to our next um, animal and topic. So let me put this back right away. The next thing we're going to be talking about is overcollection. And that's the harvesting of an animal that reduces its population um, negatively. So, the animal we'll be talking about is the black rat snake. Some ways that animals are overcollected are through pet trade, agriculture, and overfishing. This snake is um, often used in the pet trade, uh, and so they're taken out of the wild, which damages their breeding population and reduces the number of offspring that are born. I did have this silicate extra type because snakes are escape artists. Uh, so let me grab him right now. Yeah. So, the eastern black rat snake is the largest species of snake we have in Connecticut. Uh, they can grow from four to six feet long and they love to climb. Uh, they do need um, eggs out of nest, so that's one adaptation that they're really good at. Some of the ways we can help um, fight against overcollection are by supporting ethical farming and uh, trading practices, uh, doing research before you get a pet, so knowing that if you get a snake such as this, that it could be wild caught, so making sure that the source you're getting it from is ethical, as well as um, some pets in general are just not um, sustainable to own, such as hermit crabs. Um, all hermit crabs that are in captivity are wild caught, and that's something that we really don't want to encourage. Uh, this makes pretty nice. Okay, let's see. 
some of the ways that we can help fight against um, over collection. Ooh, my notes got out of order. Some of the ways we can help fight against over collection are by doing your research. So make sure that you're always paying attention to that. So I'll put him back. Um, I know we didn't get as much time with him, but he's ready to go back. Our next topic is going to be fragmentation. So let me put him away and grab the next animal. Okay. So fragmentation is when a habitat is separated um, into smaller, isolated habitats. And so some of the ways that is done is through natural processes, such as like fires, floods, and even volcanic activity. Although that's not really common here in Connecticut. Uh, but the most common cause of fragmentation is human development. So that means that roads and buildings and other um, and, <laughs> and other habitat alteration is really affecting these guys. So here we have a fox turtle. Um, and these turtles really like to stay in the same geographical range of their entire life. So if they leave that range, they'll often go back. Even they're taken out of it. Um, so they're particularly affected by fragmentation. So when there's a road built between them and the food source, they will cross that road to go there, um, no matter the cost. So sometimes they're often hit by vehicles. Um, and they'll even, if their food source is depleted, they'll still stay there, which is really um, tragic. These guys get their name because they have a um, hinged, uh, hinged plastron. And what that is, the plastron is the underside of their shell. So right here, you can see that line, and that means that when he attracts his limbs into his body and his face, he can actually move and close the front of his shell, and that's a great defensive um, adaptation, and that's really cool, and it's why there's a posture. Some of the ways you can help against fragmentation are by um, restoring developed land back into its natural wildlife, so things such as empty plots um, are things that aren't being used anymore. Um, we can also use mitigation, and what that is, is preserving lands and native wildlife. And that kind of goes along with the idea of zoning. So zoning is when we add wildlife land into developmental considerations. So when building a neighborhood, um, thinking about the ways they can help preserve the species. Uh, some things that have been done, although it's not very common in Connecticut, are things such as amphibian towns. And what those are are underneath roads. They build little tunnels for small animals, such as amphibians, to cross. Uh, without having to worry about being hit by vehicles, because that's something we really want to avoid. So I'll put him back and grab our next step. Um, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is climate change. So climate change is the overall uh, change in the average conditions of the climate, um, and that's caused by the burning of fossil fuels, the clearing of land for agriculture, industrial production, and other human activity. Um, so one animal that's particularly affected by climate change are sea turtles. So if I need to have some few um, things from sea turtles, here we have a leatherback skull. So I'll show you a picture of what a leatherback looks like. If you can see that, I'll bring it closer. And what these guys are, um, they're the largest species of turtle living on the planet currently. They can weigh up to 2,200 pounds and be between five and seven feet long. They also have a very interesting uh, characteristic. They're the last um, turtle of their family. So there's two species, uh, two families of sea turtles, and a leatherback of the last of theirs. And what that has, and what they have that no other turtle has is a layer of blubber surrounding their shell. Most turtles, as you see here, see the hawksbill. They have these hard scales. These are called scutes. Um, and the leatherback is covered in blubber, and much like seals and walruses, that blubber helps them live in colder ocean currents. They also like to follow the migratory pattern of jellyfish, which is really cool. Um, and some of the ways that sea turtles are affected by climate change is that they like to move to warmer areas. And what that does is it makes them uh, move closer to human development, which causes a wider array of problems. Um, for example, it changes nesting behavior and hatching behavior. It, uh, it also causes, let me move my desk. Uh, causes a decrease in net nesting sites uh, and accidents such as um, entanglements in nets and fishing nets and um, accidents with boat propellers, which we really want to avoid. 
So some of the ways we can help uh, work against climate change are by reducing your emissions. So things if you really need to take the car or if you can walk or bike there. And that kind of goes along with energy conservation. So looking at your own habits in your house and thinking, do I need this product to be on all day? Thinking about turning off your lights, uh, taking shorter showers. Those kind of small habit changes that really build up when all of us work together as one. Um, so together we can also create like, promote sustainability and create a global awareness of this problem. Another way to help the fight against climate change is by thinking about your carbon footprint. Uh, and one thing that adds to that is your food consumption. So eating meat requires a lot of resources and energy. And I know the idea of becoming fully vegetarian and fully vegan sounds very intimidating. But again, the small steps of maybe taking one meal a week as vegetarian family, um, it really will build up and you can all make a change. And another thing to think about is the uh, location of your food. So food that is transported or imported from across the country or around the world really racks up in uh, fossil fuels because of transportation. So supporting local food businesses and local farms really helps fight against climate change. The next thing we'll be talking about are invasive species. I'll grab an example of one right now. This is a red-eared slider, and what an invasive species is, it's an introduced or non-native species that causes or will likely cause harm to an environment. And the way they cause harm is by uh, providing competition. That means that they're competing for food, habitat, and breeding sites. Um, so these guys, the most common, um, they kind of look like painted turtles, which are a native species of turtles. Turtle, and the one way you can tell the difference is from how big is their name. These guys are called red-eared spiders, but you can see they have a red pigment on their head. And the painted turtles have a yellowish pigment. Uh, that's one way you can tell them apart. Another invasive species that is causing harm to our environment is called the emerald ash borer. And what that is, is it's a beetle that uh, lives in colonies and infects trees, which causes a disease that kills the tree in one to three years. So there's a lot of ways that invasive species cause harm to our environment. And the problem is that um, the best way to help fight against invasive species are by preventing them from ever entering. Once a species has established itself uh, into our environment, it is very hard to get rid of them. Um, so the best thing we can do is work together to prevent more from entering or, pre or from preventing them from uh, entering new parts of the state or new ecosystems. So uh, some ways you can help are by not releasing really pets into the wild, native or non-native, it can always cause problems. You can also uh, do things such as not transporting firewood because it can carry pests and other uh, insects, as well as cleaning your boots before you hike in a new area because that can cause the transportation of leaves and seeds that might sprout in a new place that you're hiking. Um, you can also help by planting native vegetation in your uh, garden. And what that does is it helps promote um, the uh, pollinators and other insects and causes pollution in their population, which means more food for everybody else. There's a lot of animals eat insects and they're good providers. The last threat that I'll be talking about today is habitat loss. Habitat loss is the process in which a habitat becomes unable to sustain a species. Uh, and this is because of deforestation, human development, and habitat alterations, which is the overall change in a habitat through things such as invasive species, pollution, and overfishing. Here we have a diamondback caravan who is moving around a lot. And these guys live in brackish water. And what that is, is it's somewhere it's flimsy between salt and fresh water. So these guys live in salt marshes and wetlands. And wetlands are the most and are the habitat most at risk in Connecticut. Uh, and that's due to things such as coastal development, as well as rising sea levels caused by climate change. Uh, so we can really help um, <laughs> uh, some of the ways we can help prevent against habitat loss are by learning about your natural habitat and how you can help them. Reducing your pollution, uh, preserving existing wetlands that might be on your uh, property, such as a lake and maybe have a marsh in your backyard. Uh, planting native education, again, always helps. Uh, and encouraging protection through legislation. So again, that's things such as the plastic bag ban. I also, lastly, wanted to talk about my process of making this capstone. 
um, and what that was like for me and how challenging it was. Um, so originally my intended audience was for elementary school kids, so I really wanted to focus on these individuals, um, and I know that using live animals really helps uh, younger kids to pay attention and be passionate about things. And I am really passionate about animals and wildlife and want to make sure that I'm encouraging their preservation um, through education. I also, there were some, a few changes due to quarantine. Um, for instance, uh, it kind of changed the animals I was going to use. Um, I would love to use more uh, amphibians because they're the group most at risk right now. However, um, during our normal programs, we use things such as uh, plastic bags, we want bags to show them to kids because they do like to hop, uh, and that's a problem. Um, however, so I had to choose to use one for us, the gray tree frog, uh, and they like to camouflage and blend into trees, so they don't often hop away, so I can hold them in my hands. Um, so that kind of limited my options um, for what animals I was going to use. Uh, I also, um, there were things such as practicing. Um, during, I, I'm still volunteering here at Magpie Nature Center uh, twice a week. However, um, due to restrictions, there's a lot of people who want to be here alone at the time so they can maintain social distancing. Um, so that meant I, can't, I couldn't come in very often to help practice uh, and work alone with these animals around the schedule. Uh, so I had to practice at home without the animal. And that means when I came in today, it's a lot of uh, work to focus. And what I'm saying is what I'm doing while I'm also being a family turtle. Um, if I like the turtle, so it's okay. Um, let's see. I, my steps to take this project, um, I did a lot of online research about environmental threats such as climate change um, and some of the ways that we as individuals can help change. Um, the reason most of my conservation efforts focus on the ways individuals can help is because that's uh, my audience. I want little kids to feel inspired to make changes. And that kind of, um, I didn't talk much about the governmental uh, efforts as much because of that. Um, this was really meaningful to me. I really hope you guys learned something about our native species and um, learn to love and protect these guys. So uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll open the floor up for questions now. Oh, actually, I want to, um, before I do that, thank you, thank everybody who helped me along through this process. So uh, thank you to my mentor, Rachel Miller, the uh, ranger at Hammond at State Park, the staff members of the Nature Center, uh, Gia and Emily, it's been a great help. Um, my advisor, Mrs. Shiafa, at the High School, and uh, my friend, Katie and Claire, who have helped me along the process. I, I'm good for questions now. Congratulations, you did an awesome job. And I think the venue, obviously, that you picked really just made your presentation. I, I love that you did it at the Nature Center. It just it really made us feel like we were part of it. Um, and I also really appreciated the little baby steps that you suggested that we can take to kind of maintain conservation. Like you said, one, one meal a week for vegetarian. I think that's realistic instead of, you know, those of us who like meat that we feel like we can't you know, completely become vegetarian, but I think that's that's reasonable. Um, and using the farms and local businesses, it's all excellent. I'm really, really impressed with your work, Julia. Um, so for those of you who are listening, if you want to use the chat feature on Zoom at the bottom of your screen, you can make comments and ask questions. And I'll read those aloud for you. So the first one is from Miss Chiapa. She said, great job, Julia. I learned so much. Thank you. See if anyone else has any other questions or comments. So now that you've done this this research and this work, do you think you'll do anything different moving forward in terms of your research and and your work at the nature center? I think um it really shows me that I like education. Uh, I've always loved animals, but going career-wise, it's hard to determine uh, which kind of path I want to follow. But doing this and thinking about all the fun facts that I'd like to tell kids in real life, um, it really made me think about um, kind of the career courses I wanted to go into. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So Miss Davis said, great job, Julia. Is that the newly found snake? It is. 
Can you show us the rest of the area that you're in? Because I see that there is there's some animals on, on the right hand side. If you can just show us, we'd love to see. So I originally was going to do this presentation in a different room. Uh -huh. However, the Wi-Fi kind of at last minute. So uh, here you can see is the background of where I was filming. We have all the buckets of the animals. Uh, and behind me, we have our native turtle um, aquarium. So these guys, we have some painted turtles. Um, a lot of our animals are hiding right now. We do have spotted turtles and mouse turtles here. There's a spot at the very bottom, if you can see it. Um, and behind me, this is the woods room in the nature center. So we have our other animals on display. So the rat snakes and the box turtles are down there. Our water snake um, and everything else. And we have our frogs and other amphibians in this room. So this was a good one to do. Um, this is where I usually am when I'm volunteering. I'll put this down. And you may have said this and I might have missed it, but how long have you been volunteering at the Nature Center? Uh, I've been volunteering here for three years, so I started this freshman year. Uh, I kind of first started here in the woods room, and now I do the birds, and I'm working uh, touch tank and everything else here, and I just learned that I really like all animals. Uh, and this is something that I want to teach kids about. And I have all the educational programs, which I love to do. So. Excellent. Well, I'm glad it was a great experience for you. I think we all feel like we learned a lot and we got the chance sitting right at our homes to feel like we were there. So we appreciate you taking the time to present at the Nature Center and going into depth in your presentation. Um, last comment is from Carter Shea. It was a very good, well-organized, professional feeling. I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> Well, it's a 